in order to make the ultimate biplane, uh, I, I started building a, the new design of wing from Eddie Salman, of which there was only one set flying in the world. So it's a, it a bit of, and it hadn't flown when I started building it. It took about three, four years to build. About halfway through that process, I thought, well, what am I going to do with the old wings? Um, actually, have I got enough bits to build another aeroplane in its entirety? And yeah, that's what I did. So I, I bought a space frame from the Aviat factory, an S2S space frame, and uh, proceeded to acquire more bits, build a, an entirely new airframe. The roll rate uh, is fantastic. The ailerons are enormous. The low speed handling of the wing is fantastic. It's got about an extra four square feet in area. So it flies very, very slowly. It hovers beautifully. So all of those things bolted onto the S2S airframe make it just a fantastic um, airplane to fly. And I'm really looking forward to displaying it. Well, obviously I started building airplanes a long time ago. In fact, I started building them at the, the age of eight because all of this is really just a big model aeroplane. And that's what I'd like to, the message I'd like to get across to people. It doesn't have to be that expensive. It's obviously very time consuming, but if you've built a, a balsa wood model, then you can build a real aeroplane. And it really brought it home to me with the basic tools that you actually need. When I started to build a new wing, I'd never built a wing before, but basically you need a couple of sawhorses. You need obviously the right type of wood, um, uh, aviation grade spruce. You make a load of ribs, you get some spars, you thread the ribs on the spars, and before you know it, you've got you know, a set of four wings, and then you bolt them to the plane. I mean, there's a bit more to it than that, but it is fairly basic engineering, hand tools that you have at home in your garage. And um, that's the beauty of the Light Aviation Authority and home-built experimental aeroplanes, is that it's, it opens the door to absolutely everybody. He spends a lot of time in here, works really, really hard, and, um, but he gets a lot done and uh, certainly produced several aeroplanes now. This, this cosy that he's building here in the background that you can see is his fourth, I think, um, which hopefully will be flying in some stage in the future. Um, and yeah, I get dragged in to help out every now and then and um, I'm essentially like a, a poor man's engineer because when he, when he needs somebody to sort of move something or shift something or help him construct something, you know, I get dragged in and, uh, and I help him. I'm passionate about the building, I'm passionate about the biplane, and I'm passionate about putting those things, two, two things together at the end of the day and flying it, and then also flying at air shows. It gives me an enormous thrill, and I hope some of that rubs off on some of the people that are watching air shows, you know, throughout the air show season. Obviously, it's been quiet this year, but usually we do 30 or 40 displays, and uh, I get a great buzz from flying at those displays and I hope people enjoy watching something slightly different on the air show circuit. Once you've finished building your aeroplane, you, you, you're left with an aeroplane sitting there uh, ready to go, but you still have to get it all approved from an engineering point of view. And although it's taken you four years to do it, you put a big pile of paperwork in and you expect it to come back the next day to fly it. It's seeing it sat there in the hangar for several weeks while you're waiting for this bit of paper to come and uh, you know, say you can go and test like that. However, I have to say the LAA, w once they get that paperwork and they know your aeroplane is sat in the hangar waiting to fly, they pull out all the stops and they did for this aeroplane. They turned around the paperwork incredibly quickly. There's queries and there's negotiation backwards and forwards, uh, making sure the I's have been dotted, the T's have been crossed. Uh, that it is safe to fly in, and they're doing that for your benefit really, so I think that's a, a really good thing. Once all the engineering has been um, approved, you get what's called a permit to test, which gives you a ticket that says you can legally fly the aeroplane. And you, in the approval process, you apply for which pilot's going to do that. So I, will, I do all the testing on my own aeroplane. And you take it up and do a full flight test profile, which again, you've negotiated with the LAA and they've approved. And normally for an aerobatic aeroplane, it'll include spinning six times left, right, inverted spinning, stalling, to make sure the aeroplane handles correctly. Once that has been done and written up, then I'll hand it over to a test pilot who will co corroborate my findings as well. So you need to have at least two people. And, and the purpose of that is that at some point in time, an aeroplane will be sold to another user. So it has to be flyable by most people. It, you can't just build and design an aeroplane and yeah, God, I can just about fly it and then pass it on to someone else. So it has to have good handling characteristics, uh, which I'm pleased to say this aeroplane is absolutely amazing.
It all started about five or six years ago when I started to build a second uh, aircraft and um, throughout this process I've had an incredible support uh, from Eddie Salmon who supported all the technical analysis and design structural analysis uh, on the airframes that I fly and also are developing you know for future jet power on the pits. Because we were doing so much analysis on the airframe to get wings, rudder, tailplane approved, different engines and cowlings and undercarriage, um, basically he modelled the whole aircraft and um, at that time he had just finished uh, designing and developing the uh, Jet Wacko in America for the American air show circuit and I off the cuff the remark was well can we stick a couple of jet engines on my pits and he said sure Rich why not we can do that in a weekend if you want um, however we are here a few, a few years later um, with that process um, nearing completion and getting more and more hopeful obviously when you start a process like this, the LAA don't give you a thumbs up straight away. Uh, basically, you have to prove it as you go along. And um, we made the decision we'd try it, and we've had to jump through various hoops and uh, prove various scenarios as we've gone along. Firstly, we had to deal with the structural mount of the engine, which Eddie has designed. It's very, very simple, and it's just basically, there's almost a scaffold tube welded into the fuse line structure, and, and, and these mounts just plug in and they're very easy to detach uh, on and off the aircraft so you can fly it with or without jet power. And then I started to look through the regulations involved with flying aeroplanes with jet turbine, whether they're commercial um, or whether they're commuter aircraft. And when you look in CS25, CS23, about the requirements, it starts talking about containment. And obviously this engine is a fantastic engine. It's very light, very powerful but it doesn't have any, it's not certified and it doesn't have any uh, um, containment uh, should we have what's called rotor burst. So I then met a chap called John Whiten who owns and runs Acroflight, who does a lot of design analysis for LA aircraft and LAA types. And he said, I, I, got, I brought him down to have a look at it. He said that Rich, there's no problem there. I'm used to designing things like that. And we'll just put a carbon shell around it and put literally some bulletproof vests around the actual rotors and that will, um, that will do some calculations and that will contain it. It all seemed quite simple. Obviously, it sounds simple on paper, but making it in, in reality is yeah an, an, another challenge, but a challenge that we've met uh, in my shed <laughs> uh, here in Worcestershire. The engine itself produces 350 pounds of thrust. Um, it's very simple. It's only got sort of one moving part and that's um, uh, the rotor. It's got a, um, a compressor at the front and a hot stage uh, turbine at the back. I spent four years building that aeroplane and it is very shiny, nice and new. And then we strapped this jet engine to it with literally 18 inches of clearance between the jet pipe and the side of the fuselage, which made it made of fabric. And, and watch all sort of flames come out of it as it, as it goes through its startup routine. But, you know, so it, 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 my heart was in my mouth when we first started it. I had some welding blankets over the wings and stuff like that so it wouldn't catch fire. But actually, we developed a lot of confidence in starting and running it. Uh, we did have some initial problems. The thrust line was hitting just the tip of the tailplane. Initially, I, I put a false tailplane on there or another one that I'm building to measure the temperatures around of the jet e-flux around the tailplane. It's about uh, 12 feet away. We covered it in uh, some, some material and pretty soon we realized it was all gonna get very hot because it all started to melt. So we adjusted the angle of the jet outwards slightly. So we're gonna lose um, a bit of that forward thrust vector that we need for the aim of the exercise, which is hovering flight. Just by moving them out a couple of degrees, um, subsequently discovered that the air velocity coming out of the jet pipe of the engine is doing like Mach 0.85. And, it, and it's obviously very warm, but it's very, very directional. So as long as it's pointing just outside the tailplane, there's no way it can impinge upon that and it's going to cause us any more issues. The way the containment uh, shell works is basically um, uh, a Kevlar shell, which we had uh, CNC machine. John did the 3D CAD drawings for it. And then he calculated um, literally the layers of um, Kevlar uh, that we'd need and there's, uh, he calculated that we'd need about 10 or 12 layers of Kevlar of a certain weight. So if, if the rotor bursts, if you can imagine throwing a, a cricket ball at a tent, um, it absorbs the energy um, through the pegs and the surrounding material. So that's the way 
uh, this is designed to work. So if the rotor bursts, um, you have to, according to the regulations, calculate the energy of a third of the mass of the rotor rotating at 46,000 RPM and that has a certain amount of energy that has to be dissipated uh, without going through any of the critical aircraft components. And so the best way of doing that was to catch it in a big bag of um, Kevlar and carbon. And so I've been, yeah, progressively putting this together. Here's what I made earlier. And uh, it's very simple, pretty light. It does weigh about five or six pounds. I've learned as I've gone along and, and I'm glad that the process is there within the LAA for adapting and modifying aeroplanes. I thought we could just send a sketch in that well, this is what we're going to do, how about it? And they would do the analysis, but it's not like that. You have to present it as if it was a certified aeroplane. So in many respects, our home bit aeroplanes have to be designed to a higher specification, a more exacting specification build than a certified aeroplane because you know, God forbid, we don't want any incidents or accidents um, as a result of those changes. When we first pulled the chocks out and I started up the jet engine with the prop running and wound up the little rear stat that runs the jet engine and that pushed in my back as we accelerated down the taxiway because we were doing taxi tests, it just felt fantastic. And the most impressive part of this aircraft is the new design of uh, wing by Eddie Salmon. So it's got very large ailerons, uh, full span, top and bottom wing, and um, they're hinged at um, a third cord, aerodynamically balanced, and they produce an incredible roll weight. Uh, the wing is about four square feet larger than the standard pitts wing, and so it gives it to much better slow speed handling characteristics. Um, moving round to the side of the aircraft, we decided to put panels in the side for easy access and maintenance. And uh, moving out onto the power plant, um, Andy Higgs designed AX50 cylinders which produce incredible power and I'm very very pleased with the performance it gives um, driven by a, a fantastic MT propeller. Um, what else have we got on here? Um, different induction system, different cooling system, a different cowling which you can't see at the moment and an aerobatic oil sump so when we're flying in knife edge flight uh, we've got continuous oil feed to the engine. Uh, we've got two oil coolers, uh, one at the rear and one at the front. Uh, moving around, we've got the traditional aerobatic sight, and of course, most, one of the most important uh, indicators is the reverse gear indicator, which is <laughs> a high-tech bit of string. But when it's going that way, we're going forwards, and when we do a torque roll and it's going that way, uh, we know we're going backwards, and uh, when we go backwards, we reverse the control sense. Um, beautiful... Uh, side hinge canopy um, with uh, jettison mechanism uh, and it's pretty basic on the inside but uh, the visibility out of this canopy is much better than the traditional pits bubble canopy. Fairly basic instruments, I do have an artificial horizon. On this engine I do have a lambda sensor which tells us what mixture setting to run at maximum power. It's all looking quite positive and you know it's getting to quite an exciting phase really.